I was wrong about one pretty big thing in my Steven Anderson response video, and one less important but complicated thing, and I have to walk both of these things back. If you didn't see that video, this video will make no sense. Anderson was right about these two things, and I was wrong. He made a response video, which I have watched. He demonstrated that I made this one especially big blunder, one that was especially indefensible in such a video. And it turns out a friend of mine, Tim Berg, had already warned me without my catching it. I misread the handwriting on 1602 Bishop's Bible. Look at it for yourself. I read these letters right here as to be, rather than he be, which is what they actually say. I'll offer some evidence for my error in a bit. My second error was rushing the video out too quickly without doing some basic homework, namely missing the simple fact that Deuteronomy is almost certainly here in this verse it's we're talking about. It's not talking about killing a malefactor by hanging, but about exposing his body on a tree after he's already been stoned or killed some other way. This should have been obvious, and in fact, nearly all the commentators pointed out. I didn't check cross-references or commentaries. I apologize to my viewers and to Steven Anderson, who was right about this too. I've put a note in that video for viewers to watch this one, and I've turned off comments there. I'm not taking it down because I believe that my main three points are still basically valid, but I've gone from feeling that my case was about 90% probable to feeling like it's 66 and two thirds percent probable. I still think I have enough votes for impeachment, but if any of the senators get skittish and go to the other side of the aisle, we might lose this one. Let me talk through my errors and then explain my new assessment. First, I think you can see that the note above is here in the copy of the Bishop's Bible that I discussed in the last video. It sure does look like to be. I only just got access to this resource and I am just not practiced in reading it. This is why we have paleographers and I am not one. Tim Berg has far better skills than I do. And he pointed out to me that the H here in inheritance, this word inheritance, uh, looks an awful lot like the letter that we're concerned with in verse 22. And a nearby handwritten lowercase o doesn't have a curly Q in it. Oh, where can I find that thing? It was near verse 9. Yeah, right here. It doesn't have a curly Q like the second character here, which therefore proves to be an E. Handwriting conventions over time have changed, and I was misled. I misread the A also that was inserted before tree. I thought it was another caret symbol, you know, sticking something in the text. And this all strengthens Anderson's case that verse 22 contains a typo because he was right in his response video. The handwritten notes here perfectly match the 1611 King James, minus the two words he thinks are a typo. This fact alone weakens my case considerably. Second, I feel worse about this second error, error because I just I don't live to interpret handwriting accurately, but I do live to interpret the Bible accurately, and I miss something I should have known that I should have seen in my Bible study resources, even if I didn't know it off the top of my head. If I checked instead of rushing to print the way I did, trying to capitalize on irony and controversy, I wouldn't have missed this. It's very unlikely that this verse in Deuteronomy envisions death by hanging or surely crucifixion. Instead, it's death by other means and then exposing of the body for shaming them. Anderson was right about this, and this interpretation didn't even occur to me in my haste. This error weakens my case too, because it makes it somewhat less likely that the King James translators viewed being about to be put to death as immediately prior to being hanged on a tree. Does that make sense? That's what I argued in the first video, that the to be was likely added as a means to show that we were dealing with a man who was scheduled for execution by hanging. I regard this as still possible as a read of the King James, but not likely. It's possible, actually, possible that whoever inserted these words to be committed the same error I did. Perhaps he thought that for this verse to be used in Galatians, because it is referenced there to speak of Jesus, the death here in Deuteronomy had to be parallel fully to Jesus' death, which meant death on a tree, not just exposure on a tree after death. Again, this feels possible, but not likely to me, which leaves me with no confident explanation for why these words were inserted. I just gave my best guess, but even I regard it as unlikely to be accurate. So we're left with a situation that's important for both of us to recognize you and me. Uncertainty. Anderson finished his response video by saying that he's 100% certain that he's right. And to his credit, his points are weighty, weightier than I thought initially. But he also used the word probably more than once in his video to describe his view. He concedes some uncertainty. I too have balanced my claims with qualifiers, though I hold my points to be weighty as well. 
Now, I think those three points from the first video are still valid. First, no one who touched the King James over the centuries took these two words out. Yes, they could have been simply missed. They're somewhat obscure, but they weren't taken out with other typos in the various revisions that occurred up until 1769. And by the way, I did misspeak about the existence of typos in the King James in my first video. I really am aware of various typos that have occurred in various printings. I named one the Wicked Bible, and I've seen the famous He and She Bibles too with my own two eyes. What I was trying to say, rather poorly I admit, is that I'm not aware of typos that persisted through all the editions and revisions of the King James, aside from this, if it is one. David Norton, too, kept the words in his 2005 critical edition of the King James, and so did F.H.A. Scrivener when he published a critical edition of the King James in 1873. Now, Scrivener put these words to be in italics, and this suggests that he was aware that the Hebrew does not call for them. But the fact that he kept them meant, as best I can tell from reading his preface, that he regarded them to be chosen by the King James translators. Second, and I'm a little confused as to Anderson's pos position on this, he sort of seemed to agree with it. The phrase does make sense as written, given the English of the time, which used the subjunctive for if statements in a way modern English does not. I think I showed this. Third, the OED and Google Books show examples of this very construction, he be to be something. It's not just possible English, it's actual English. It shows up in the written record. A typo is an obvious mistake, right? It's we the people of these United States in order to form a more perfect onion, to borrow from Dan Wallace. It's a clear error. This is not an obvious error. It makes sense. It works. So again, sometimes we have uncertainty in Bible interpretation, less than absolute certainty or no warrant for certainty in a given case. We don't have uncertainty all the time. I'm a resurrection absolutist, as I said in the Textual Confidence Collective videos. And we don't have uncertainty on big points of doctrine, I wouldn't say, but we have it on minor points of interpretation, like this one. Why does all this matter? A number of commenters struggled to understand why I would bother with my video, and indeed, we're perilously close, and I brought us here to quarreling about words. Fundamentally, it is indeed a minor matter. It's two obscure words in one verse, a verse which people are no more likely to understand or misunderstand with or without the two obscure words. It's a molehill made of mint, anise, and cumin. But I took the time to make the video because I thought it would be fun and novel to defend the King James against Stephen Anderson because I believed that he had been tripped up by an archaism, though I am not so certain of this anymore, and actually I welcome his clarification. And because of two points made by one of my most faithful supporters, a real friend in this work, Josiah Dennis, he said, and I quote, Anderson makes some fundamental assumptions that show his thinking in this direction. He assumes that the translators produced an inerrant translation. Therefore, any errors rightly deduced by comparison with the Hebrew must necessarily be produced by a printer. That's a great point, Josiah makes. Anderson insisted that the King James is perfect. Whether the words to be are a typo accidentally inserted into the King James text or an error purposefully inserted into the King James text, these words, in Anderson's view, can't be attributed to the intent of the King James translators, if they're wrong. But why would God, in his providence, allow a printer to mess up what he made perfect among translators? And does the Bible really lead us to believe that a certain set of early 17th century Anglicans would get their translation perfectly right? They certainly didn't think so. They said so in their preface. Anderson is treating them as effectively inspired. How else could they have done perfect translation work? And here's another insight from Josiah Dennis. Anderson is treating typos in the King James very much like I would treat textual variants in the original Greek and Hebrew. I do believe in God's providential preservation of his word, and I do too, by the way, a view that allows for typos and textual variants. But to say that God chose to preserve his word only in the King James or any family of manuscripts, etc., is to be more confident than Scripture itself is on this subject. Scripture declares it's being God-breathed in the originals. But there is no verse anywhere that declares that God has preserved his word for English-speaking people, or I'd add Urdu-speaking people, only in one translation, in this case the King James. Let our confidence always be in what Scripture itself declares. That's it, Josiah. I said something like this in a throwaway digression in the first video, but it deserves more attention, and Josiah has given it that attention, but I'll leave it at that. As I wrap up, I want to stand by one claim that Anderson took as an, as an insult and back off another that he took as insulting. You really just can't predict how other people will receive your words. I guess you just need to listen to them to find out. Here's the claim that I'll back off of. I implied at the beginning of the video that Anderson might possibly tailor his message to his constituency. I said I was surprised that he was willing to posit a typo in the King James because of all the followers that 
he might lose. I'm glad he took that as offensive. He sees himself as sincere. Even if I think he's wrong on a lot of points, I want to see him as sincere as well. Yes, even the infamous Steven Anderson. And of course, I want to be seen that way too. Who doesn't? And the way Anderson responded to me showed sincerity. I felt I provoked Steven Anderson to make cogent arguments rather than to reach for personal abuse. That shows sincerity on his part. Here's the claim I'll stand by that he found offensive. I spent more time dwelling on language change than the great majority, not all, but the great majority of King James Onlyists. Anderson took this as condescending. I take it as a simple fact and not insulting or at least not intended to be. I spent thousands of hours focusing on the effects of language change on the King James, squirreling around in various uh, dictionaries. In my King James study project, I believe I proved as conclusively as, in, as anyone can who's not independently wealthy and can afford a much bigger study that King James only pastors have not spent these hours, by and large. They, by and large, don't understand the archaisms in the King James as well as they think they do. I had one guy who got them all right, of course. This is not insulting because, as I've repeatedly said, it's not modern readers' fault that language has changed in so many subtle ways since the time of the King James. The only other time I've interacted with Stephen Anderson was in my second video on the false friend study, study to show thyself approved. I did not name him because I was wary of provoking the kind of malice and slander that he had already issued toward me and that he's done many times since then. But malice and slander he did not use in his recent reply. But I did handle his arguments in that second study video, and one of his central arguments was a mistake just as huge as the ones that I have now admitted to in this video. You'll have to go back and see that video. I'll link in the show notes for yourself to get the details. I'm not currently planning to follow up unless more interesting evidence is brought to light on Deuteronomy 21:22. but if for some reason he'd like me to engage further, this is what I'd ask. Stephen, go watch my second study video and reevaluate.